Yeah, so I think people are joining and I just want to welcome everyone. Um, it's great seeing you here. Some of you we already know, some of you we don't know yet and we would love to get to know you guys. Um, and just an FYI, we are having this event recorded. Um, so if you're not comfortable showing your face or speaking up, that's totally fine. But uh, if you are comfortable, please do open your mic and talk with us and we would love to have a discussion. Um, yeah, um, hi, Adrian. And also, if you can see um, in the chat, um, I put a link there. So while we wait for um, a couple of minutes for people to join, um, then you guys can go ahead and fill out the check-in form. Um, it will help us to keep track of you if you're interested in similar events, and then we can keep you notified. And also, you will be um, enter our raffle to win one of the cool swags, similar to what I'm wearing. <laughs> so, so yeah, please fill out your form. Um, and then we'll get started shortly. And then we have PJ here. He is an education evangelist. He's from GitLab. And we have Christina as well. She's a manager. She's from um, GitLab as well. So yeah, welcome everyone. Um, we have Spencer. He's going to host this one. He's um, a part of our GDSE student club. He's a tech lead. And I'm leading the whole club. So yeah, welcome. <laughs> Probably to say hi, dump it in the chat. Let us know which degree you are pursuing. Um, and then what's your interest about GitHub, um, GitLab and also DevOps? If you know anything, please throw in the chat. We'll love to know. Or open your mic. <laughs> I don't know anything about DevOps. I'm kidding. This is a joke I make all the time <laughs> to myself. I actually joked about it on Twitter today. I was like, are you ever trying to explain DevOps? And then you suddenly realize that you thought you knew something and then you realize you know nothing. And like all of the engineers that follow me and all the people, all my team mates were like, yep, that's me all the time. Our staff developer advocate who's been with GitLab for four years was like, yeah, all the time. I feel like I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I do know a little, so don't worry. <laughs> so at least what you telling us today is not going to be a lie, right? <laughs> no, this is all going to be the truth. I'm not just making it up. There's a whole presentation that we built over the past few weeks, months, this has been in the making, this this presentation, months. Uh, so tons of great information, a little bit of history. It's going to be very nice. I'm very excited. Me too, me too. So yeah, you are our boss. Whenever you want to start, we can start. But yeah, do you feel the form? If you, I don't know if people can see the chat if they join later. So if you guys don't see the link, let me know so I can resend the link. Yeah, they that in Zoom chat. Until, yeah, they can't see it on, on, on um, but what they but before they join. So oh. yeah, sure. Okay, here it's we go. I'm just gonna keep sending it once in a while. <laughs> I used to have to do that all the time when I was teaching. Um, yeah. <laughs> I taught during the pandemic, and it would be like I had my kids on Zoom, and I would send a link, and then someone would join, and I was like, oh, send and then someone else would join, and I sent it like four times. <laughs> so yeah, you see, it was bombarding. Sorry. <laughs> no choice it's spam in the chat yeah yeah hey jessica welcome hello uh, hi we're gonna start soon and uh i guess let me dump in the chat again so there's the form for you to fill out to check in um mm -hmm. and it's gonna get you into our raffle as well so we're gonna do a little bit of raffle to send out some of our cool swags so mm -hmm. uh yeah fill out the form <laughs> and then you will see that there's a slide stick share in the chat as well um yeah sorry I, did you say something yes. did i cut you jessica oh no 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 uh, i was just gonna look in the chat for the form yeah so yeah i think um spencer what do you say you're the boss when are we starting yeah i think we can start it uh right now yeah so hello everyone uh this um uh, talk or meeting and or the lecture is about the DevOps. So we have the, the PJ and Christina for here. They are from GitLab. And then we are going to uh hand over to them to, for them to like kind of give us the introduction about what exactly is DevOps and then how can you use DevOps or maybe you, you have used DevOps before but you didn't know that actually you are using DevOps. Yeah. So yeah, table is yours. PJ. 
let me unmute myself first and do that the right way. And then let me start my slides on the right spot. And then let me share my screen and do the most common spoken phrase in 2022. Can y'all see my screen? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Nailed it. We are off to a fantastic start already then. So uh, like Spencer said, my name is PJ. Um, we're here to talk about an introduction to DevOps. And like he said, it's something you might already be a little familiar with, something you might not know anything about. But either way, hopefully today you learned something new and you can discover a little more about DevOps. So first off, uh, an introduction to myself, like I was introduced earlier, I am a education evangelist at GitLab. Um, I go by he, him, so those are my pronouns. I live in Florida, I'm in Orlando right now. I love Disney uh, because I live in Orlando. That's kind of our thing here. And I'm um, really into poetry and music, especially 80s music and 80s and 90s culture. Um, and I'm a former educator. That's how I came to this position. I taught high school English for 10 years. And I also taught um, ESOL to uh, Korean kids. I lived in Korea for a year and a half and did some ESOL education over there. Um, if you want to find me, I'm on Twitter at Mets and Around. I'm on GitLab at PJ Mets. Feel free to tag me if you ever working in GitLab and you're looking at something and don't know what to do next. And I'm also on Twitch at Mets and Around as well, where I stream maybe about once or twice a week. Right now I'm learning Python. I actually have my book here, Learning Python, um, as well as doing it online, um, because Python is not a language I had experience with. Uh, I was mostly C Sharp and Node before I came to GitLab. So one of the things that we were talking about in uh, this Zoom before everyone came through was this idea of software is eating the world. This is from Mark Andreessen, who's a famous uh, venture capitalist and an investor in tech and a former software engineer. And what we mean by this and what I take from this is that software has become a ubiquitous part of everybody's life. From the moment that the iPhone hit in 2007, software became the thing that everyone was going to need to do. I always tell people, even Zaxby's, Wendy's, McDonald's, they have apps and those apps are built for these companies. So you have to have some kind of software. And specifically, we want to talk about sweet green. Now, I'm from Florida. Uh, we don't have sweet greens here, um, but I'm looking forward to getting one because I tried one when I was on the West Coast once, and it was a really good salad. And I'm actually happy about this picture because that was my order was the kale Caesar, and I was super excited about it. But sweet greens' whole uh, kind of deal is that they don't say we're just a salad chain. They say we're not just a salad restaurant. We are a tech company. And when they IPO'd, they IPO'd like a tech company. They're not just an app where you build a salad and get it delivered to you. It's not just integrated with DoorDash or Uber Eats or things like that. It is a revolution in the way that they are approaching the supply chain as well. They're bringing tech to the supply chain. So everything from where the food is grown to how it's transported to distributors, all of that process of making a salad that ends up in front of you is now being taken over by software. And they're looking to change the world in that way. Um, the CEO said, we see Sweetgreen as being more than just a restaurant. We are evolving into a food platform. And that's the way that the new world works. We've got software engineers and security analysts and data engineers working for Target and Walmart and all these companies that you wouldn't normally associate with tech, but they have to keep up with the world and the world is software at this point. So let's talk about the way we got here and the, the way that you likely will get here. So a developer's workflow, this is when it's just you working on a project. And this is very common for people who are learning to code, uh, computer science students, any students that are learning to code, you often do it on your own first. So I started learning to code in 2020 and I stored all the source code on my computer. I compiled everything and ran everything locally. And to debug, I just looked at the code right where it was. I didn't have any other tools. It was just me, myself and I building a website or building a simple game in C-sharp, something very straightforward. It's just what's on my computer and that's it. And I remember I had a moment when I was working on uh, my first website with a friend of mine, he was helping me learn. And I was like, he told me to run my program. We were using ASP.NET Core. And that's a C-sharp backend with some HTML on the front end. And it 
it ran and then it gave me an address and I was like, oh, there's my website. And I tried to send him the link and he was like, you can't send me the link. I was like, well, no, it's running. He goes, yeah, it's running on local hosts. That means it's just on your computer. You're the only one who can see it. And I was like, oh, well, how, how do I send it to you? And I was like, oh, well, that's kind of the next step. I had learned how to build this website, but the next step was sharing it with people. And that's what we find our two big challenges when you're coding. When we're coding on our own, we get to a point where we want to share what we're building with the world. We meet some obstacles. So first off is collaborating. If you want to share specifically your code with somebody, say you're working on something in JavaScript and you've got a friend who you think is great at JavaScript and you ask them, hey, I've got this code. I can't figure out what's wrong with it. Can I show you it? And they're like, yeah, you wouldn't just send them the file as like an attachment in an email. It's not as efficient. So some way to collaborate on our code is important. You know, when you're doing it on your own, you don't have to worry about collaboration. But software, especially the software that's eating the world, is not built on your own. It's built as part of a team. It's built as part of a team that's part of a team of teams that makes up a company. So you have to know how to collaborate with friends, colleagues, or anyone else. So if you're doing open source, you need a way that you can work in open source and collaborate on it. The other challenge is to run our code somewhere so everyone can see it. And that's that local host issue that I had where I wanted people to see my website, but I needed the place to host it. So these are the two challenges that I want you to keep in mind as we're talking about the solutions that we've discovered uh, over the years for teams of developers. So this is the software development life cycle. This is how software is made in a very broad sense. So first is the idea. Someone says, hey, I've got a great idea for an app. And those of you who are about to graduate with CS degrees, get ready. All of your friends are going to come to you with great ideas for apps. Be ready. So ideas that solve a particular problem faced by a set of target users looking at the world and saying, this is a problem that needs fixing. You know, we've got all these taxis, but they're so expensive. I mean, what if, what if you were driving somewhere and you could just give somebody a ride? That's how Uber started, right? What if you could just deliver food from any restaurant? That's how DoorDash gets started. What if you've got 240 characters of an idea that you really need to shout at the world? And there's Twitter. So there's some sort of problem and the app solves it. That's ideation. You move on to requirements. You say, okay, what will it take to actually make this app happen? What are the requirements of this app? What are the rules? How will it function? What will it do? And after that, it's design, where a team of designers actually say, this is how it's going to look. This is how the flow for the user is going to move. And they design the whole app visually as well as structurally. After that, it's development. This is the part that everyone thinks about when they think about coding or an engineer development, writing the code that makes the app work. After that, you have to test it and make sure that it actually works the way you think. Test for weird edge cases is always a good idea, making sure that someone doesn't like hold down the screen and hit the power button at the same time and somehow that logs them into the root and then they have access to data. These things that happen inside of apps that you have to test for. Oh, well, they went from the home page directly to here and that crashes the app. You don't want your app crashing, so you test for it. Finally, you deploy this working app to the world in a place where everyone can access it, whether that's to a cloud provider like AWS or Google Cloud or um, Azure or Heroku. If you're deploying somewhere, that's making it available to other people. And then the last thing is maintenance. This is all steps that has to occur to make an app happen. Now, when software started being built in the, oh my gosh, like 60s, 70s. It kind of followed the same uh, style of production that most of the world did, which was kind of an assembly line. It was you make your part and then you pass it to the next team and they make their part and they pass it to the next team. It's very much like the way Model T cars were made in the early 20th century. In the 1900s, there was one person who put the wheel on and the next person put the screws on to keep the wheel on the next person and sort of so on and so on. That's how software was built originally. And if you're 
old enough to remember like me, software used to literally be shipped out to people on CDs or on floppy disks. It wasn't something you could just download or literally have access to on a computer in your pocket. So this is how it used to work. There was the concept, the initiation of that concept and the sort of uh, coming together and deciding who the users were gonna be, who was it for, an analysis of how it was gonna work, actually designing it, construction of it, testing of it, deployment, and then you just send it out and you're like, all right, the software is out there now, let's see what happens. This is the waterfall method and this is how software is built for a while until Agile came along. Agile said, software is not a car. It's not a, a, a can of beans. It's not, there's so much that the production, the, the um, oh, I totally forgot the, the word for it, the assembly line. An assembly line does a lot of things in our world. All our electronics are made by it. You know, beds, cars, planes, everything's on the assembly line. People started looking at software going, this is different. It's not it's not as good on an assembly line. Because if you get down here and there's a problem and you send it back, design is already working on something else. So there's not a lot of communication between these groups. So Agile said, well, what if we sort of connect these groups? And so taking the first few groups and saying, not that they're a single team, but opening up communication between those teams. And then design and construction opening up communication so they're forced to work together more. And agile becomes the way that software is made. This goes on for a while. And then I want to say it's around 2007, 2006. I actually read an article, an academic article from 2007 that said, we need an assembly line for software. And when I read it, I was like, that's describing DevOps. So within agile, what we end up seeing happen is we end up with this wall between two major sides. We have developers on one side that are writing the new features for code that are looking for ways to deliver the software faster. Here's another update, here's another update. We're making things better. If you've ever opened a social media uh, app and it suddenly looks different and it catches you off guard, that's the developers. They created a new way to experience Instagram. And developers are making changes every single day. On the other side of this wall were operators. This was ops. Their job was to keep the service or the app stable, to keep it secure, and to keep it reliable. So on one side, you've got people who are constantly trying to make changes and trying to make new features and saying, we added this great new feature for our users. And on the other side, you have operators who are going, what if that's not secure? Have we really tested this? What if someone can access and it becomes sort of not a war, but operators and developers can be kind of at odds from time to time. Dev and ops were separate for a while. And that's when DevOps comes along and tries to connect the two. We wanna break that wall down and we want more collaboration. In the 21st century, that that wall between the two, if you're not moving faster than your competitors, then you're being left behind. When Netflix moved to a streaming service back in the 2010, 2009-ish, they used to just be shipping DVDs to your door. Then they became a streaming service and it took off. If you're not keeping up with Netflix, then you're just finding a better way to do the old thing. DevOps helps you move faster through the software cycle because it creates more collaboration. So these are the stages of the DevOps life cycle. We have plan, create, verify, package, release, configure, monitor, and notice that this one over here on the ops side is still plan. So ops is now involved in planning with dev, Dev is creating the code, verifying it, packaging it, and then ops takes over for release, but we got rid of that wall in the middle. It's constant collaboration between the two, and that makes for faster releases. One of the central ways that DevOps works and one of the central pieces of technology that makes it even possible is Git. And Git is the main technology that GitLab uses, it's source control. And it's also what GitHub uses. Source control is a way to keep track of what's happening to the code because code bases can be huge. My Twitter bots are 100 lines. That's it. 
It's 100 lines of JavaScript and it makes a bot tweet at Mountain Dew every single day yelling at them to sponsor me. Complicated programs, complicated apps, I, Zoom, you know, like <laughs> Google Slides, all the things I'm using right now require tons of code and it needs a place to live. So the example we want to give you about uh, how Git helps and how Git allows you to work collaboratively is in something that you're probably familiar with, which is Google Docs. So the old way of working um, with software can be compared to Microsoft Word. And basically one person could edit the document at the time. They would type up whatever they needed in the document. They would save it. And then they would send that file off to somebody else. Then that person gets it and they add something to it. And then they send it off or they send it back. It's a lot of back and forth when you've got a file saved on a hard drive. You end up with multiple copies. Uh, as an educator, I can't tell you how many times I had the same PDF with slight small changes. So I ended up with PJ, you know, test two version five, final, final, final copy in all caps. So I know that that's the one to use or renaming old copies don't use me, but I needed to keep it just in case I needed to go back to an old version later on. So you end up with multiple copies. You end up with version conflicts where you're like, do I have, do I have the most recent document? Okay, can you send me the most recent document, please? That takes up time, that takes up energy. You're waiting for feedback. You send something to someone and you have to wait for them to see the email, open it, get in there, make their changes, save it, send it back. It just takes time. And most of all, it's sequential. It all happens in order. Google Docs, you've got eight people, 20 people. I've seen a hundred people inside a Google Doc at the same time all collaborating at the same time. There is one copy that everybody works with and the changes are just reflected there in the document. There's no conflicts because you're never taking it away, saving it and bringing it back. And there's it's conflicting with what someone else did. There's real-time feedback. I could be typing an article and my manager could be right there giving me comments and helping me understand what needs to be fixed and changed. Or she could just be making the changes right behind me for things that I might've missed. And then finally, it's concurrent. It's all right there. Same time, same people. This is how Git works. Git is a central repository of your code, of your app that you pull onto your local computer. The Git lives in the cloud or on GitLab in a repository. Pull it to your computer, change whatever you need to change. Lines 40 through 52, I changed the way the function was running because it was throwing an error. You save it you push it back in and the repository reflects that change. At the same time you're doing that, your colleague or your teammate, if you're in a, in a team project, has also pulled it to their local computer and they change lines 20 through 26. And then they say, oh, I needed to make this a little more efficient, so I changed the code. And they push it back and now those changes are reflected. Git is the heart of DevOps because it allows for collaborative work more quickly and more easily. All right, so we're gonna talk about the history of DevOps. So what happens is uh, developers love automation. They love things that can be done automatically that can take work off of their plate. If something can be automated, developers are gonna to wanna to do it. So what happens is a lot of companies come up with these great tools that help you do things more quickly. Let's say you're wanting a repository. GitHub was the place to do it. Let's say you want to work collaboratively with other people. You're gonna be going to Jenkins. Let's say you're looking to do some CI CD, some automation, real automation of your code. JFrog, New Relic, Chef. These were all companies that at one time were creating these tools and that was their tool. So you would take their tool, you would use it in your development process. And that's how it worked for a long time. You just had several different tools. And it was great at first because having these specific tools sped so much up in, uh, oh, the chat's happening. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything in the chat. Um, it sped up production and that was important to people. So this was working in a while. At the very beginning, like I said, automation, tools, all of this is happening in the very beginning and everyone's kind of trying to figure out, okay, we got this DevOps methodology, this culture. How do we make it work best? And 
companies start popping up. So that's bring your own DevOps. It was, you're gonna have uh, all these different tools and it can increase productivity and that's great, but it ends up with an uncoordinated purchasing. And if you're a company, you don't wanna buy, you know, <laughs> 14 different licenses for an app so that your team can be more productive. Cause yeah, they're more productive now, but now you've got 14 licenses and now you need to manage those 14 licenses. And now you need to teach people how to use these 14 apps. So it can be a little redundant. Maybe you've got a tool that does two things, but you don't like the way it does that second thing. And so you've got another tool that does that a little better, but some people on the team prefer the first tool. So it ends up with a lot of, each team is selecting their own tools and that can lead to conflicts between teams. Well, we were using JFrog. Oh, well, we were using Travis CI. Well, that's a conflict and that really shouldn't be happening. And that no alignment among teams can bring down productivity. So there was an increase, but it's not as high as it could be. After B, uh, BYO, bring your own DevOps, we had best in class. Over time, we people started to understand, okay, this tool really seems to be the one that a lot of people are using. So we start to see coordination between teams. All right, look, we're all going to use GitLab for its CI. We're all going to use JFrog. We're all going to use Atlassian. We're all going to use this. And everyone agrees, okay, this one does a really good job. We're going to use that one. It reduces the license cost. It reduces the training overhead because now all the teams are working on the same, uh, same tools. But what's hard is now you've got not really a connection between these two tools. Maybe Atlassian doesn't play as nice with JFrog as you'd like. Maybe GitLab doesn't play as nice with this one as you'd like. Maybe there's not really a connection and you kind of have to manually make these connections and that's really hard. So that's adding time. You can lead to data loss from one app to another to another. It's just not as ideal, but it's still better than it was before. Best in class, after best in class, we end up moving on to DIY. This is where you see a lot of like DevOps engineers where they are making integrations between these apps. And a lot of apps start to know, okay, we know that this other app is really being used a lot by DevOps teams and by companies that are doing DevOps. We should work on making an integration with them to make it easier for our uh, customers to use it. So now you've got things like, for instance, Heroku. Heroku can automatically deploy from your GitHub account. You've got Atlassian automatically connecting to JFrog. You've got these different tools starting to recognize each other and they start building the connection for you. Or a DevOps engineer makes that connection and forces it with some code and some scripts. It's still not perfect because you've still got separate tools that you're having to draw these bridges between them. And that can be a fragile and tenuous connection if you built it yourself. DevOps engineers are really smart people. They work really hard on making these connections work and they're really good at building awesome infrastructure to host all these tools at the same time. But what happens when your DevOps engineer leaves for another job and you're left with something and you're like, oh, well, they always knew what to do here. So now what happens? So these connections are great and they take a lot of like grit and determination and, and hard work, but it can be tenuous and it can be fragile and security and testing usually comes pretty late in this process too. So it was again, good, but it's not the best that it can be. So at GitLab, we believe that we're in the DevOps platform, a single platform that has all the tools that you need in order to efficiently change your company into a DevOps company your software development is going to be DevOps. And all the tools you need, all the stages of the uh, DevOps lifecycle are in a single place. One app, one website, or one self-hosted place where your team goes to do everything, to plan it, to code it, to test it, to defend it against outside intrusion, security, everything's in one place. And this is what we call the DevOps platform. This is the new thing. It's faster. You've got one place to go. There's fewer errors. You don't have to worry about integrating with a whole nother tool because the tool's right there in the same window, in the same tab. Whatever you need is right there. So this is a 
sort of example of how working with a team will look when you're talking about DevOps and when you're using source control with Git. So Git works on an idea of branches. The main branch is the branch of code that ends up getting deployed. So if you're looking at, say, a code base on GitLab, when you find the branch called main, that's the code that's usually live somewhere. When you want to make a change to the code, if you change it in main, it changes live, it changes in production. And that's how you end up with you know, production going down. And that's how you end up with broken databases and problems like that. So in order to avoid that, you don't change the main branch until you're sure it's ready. So what you do is you create an issue right here on the main branch. And in the issue, you discuss what it is that you want to change. Hey, we've noticed that uh, the loading time on this particular part of the app seems to be taking a lot longer ever since we made the last update. We'd like to explore what we can do to speed that time back up to what it used to be. It was a little faster before. We've added new features, so we need to figure out how we can maintain speed while still having these great new features that we want. And you create this issue, you tag people in there, you have them come in and you talk about it and you collaborate. You've got designers, you've got developers, you've got ops people all in the same discussion, talking to each other about what to do and how to do it. From the issue, you create what we call a merge request. If you're familiar with GitHub, they're called pull requests over there. We call it a merge request. And you say, you make this merge request. You're like, hey, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add this functionality. And inside that merge request, you've now created a whole new branch. That branch is named whatever you want. Like I said, this one is main. In some older systems, it's called master. Now it's called main. You create this merge request, you got a totally different branch. And that's where you start changing the code. You work in this other branch and you make changes to the code. You're like, you know what we noticed? There's a function running here that doesn't even get used anymore. It's eating up some cycles in our CPU and we should get rid of it. So you delete it. You add in a new function. You notice that there's a redundancy, right? Fix that redundancy, make some changes, shorten up your code, tighten it up, make it better. And those are where you're committing changes to this new branch. After that, you've got a CI pipeline. CI stands for continuous integration. And that's where you run some tests some automatic tests that when you commit code, the CI goes, hey, notice some new code coming in. I'm gonna run these tests for you. I'm gonna check for secrets. I'm gonna check for uh, problems. I'm gonna run this code and make sure it runs the way you think it should be run. After that, everyone reviews the app. You can literally, if it's JavaScript or if it's a, a web-based app, you can actually click a button in GitLab and you can see the app as it will look changed. I use this all the time when we're updating our handbook or when we're making changes to our landing page for GitLab for Education. I wanna see how it's gonna to look to the future user without having to push it to production. After that, more discussion, more collaboration, more time spent making sure that this is the way that you want it to look. Is this the, the best change that we can make? Is this the right way to move it? Is this a good iteration, a good small change that makes it better? You got it, let's approve the changes. You merge this branch back into main and main now has all the changes that were made up here. Main now has that here. The CD pipeline runs, which stands for uh, continuous deployment or continuous development. And that now runs automatically deploys it and your app is live and it never had any downtime. It just instantaneously changes right here because of CD. And now you use the rest of the GitLab tools to monitor your app. How's everything looking? Are we having any problems? Are we noticing any secret detection that has, has uh, kind of led to some problems? This part right here, monitoring your app and this part right here, writing code, this used to be two completely different teams that never talked to each other, except to yell at each other because one was mad at the other. This team here that's monitoring is in constant communication with the rest of the company and the rest of the teams. I've got a short video here. Um, I do need to unshare my screen and do share sound so you guys can actually hear it. So give me a quick second, I'm gonna unshare my screen. Unshare my screen. And I wanna make sure you guys can hear the video. 
And this is an example of what that process I just described looks like between me and Christina. Hi, my name is PJ Metz. I'm the education evangelist at GitLab on the education team. And I'm here to talk to you about how you can use GitLab in order to facilitate some cooperative work with maybe some teammates of yours if you're at work or some fellow students if you're working on a group project. So what we're looking at right now is my profile page that's got uh, my activity and all the stuff that I've been doing on GitLab. You can see how many contributions I've been making on different days. But what I need to do is I need to work on my Twitter bots. I have a bunch of Twitter bots in a project called Divas Live. And in here, what I want to do is I need to add a new variable in here so that way we can see it printed to the console. I like, I like having stuff show up in the console. So I need to do that, but I want to get my teammates involved. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an issue and I'm going to expand this over here. I'm going to head to issues and I'm going to make a new one. And I'm going to call this add console log for a uh, variable because I want to see that that variable is showing up correctly. Uh, I'm going to assign this to me for right now, but I'm also going to assign it to my manager so that my manager knows what I'm doing. I'm not worried about milestone labels or weights, but I'm going to go ahead and create this issue here. So now this issue is here. This is a change that we want to make to some code and everything starts as an issue. I've got my boss and myself tagged on it. And if I want to make some changes, I need a merge request. So right here is a big blue button directly from an issue. I can create a merge request. So you can see it creates a merge request for us. I can open this up in the web ID and I'm going to start making some changes now here in this uh, merge request. So here I am in the web IDE and I need to head into kickstart.js. This is a Twitter bot I have that tweets at Mountain Dew every day asking them to sponsor me because I love Mountain Dew. And what I do is I have an array here and I do some uh, code here that pulls a random element out of that array and that element becomes the tweet. So I have several different tweets in here. But I turn it into a variable here called post status, but I want to see what it's going to be in the log before it just becomes a tweet. So I need console log for that. So console.log post status. And that's there. It's great. So what we're going to do is I need to say I want this change to be made in the merge request. And I need my boss to check it because I don't just want to push anything to main. So I'm going to click commit. I'm committing it to the branch that I'm on right now, which was automatically created from the issue. Adding a console log here. And I'm going to commit that. All changes are committed. We can go back to our merge request over here. And we can see here's the merge request. And we can see the changes right here. So now I'm going to hand this off to Christina Hupi, who's going to tell us whether we can merge this or not. Hey, everyone. I'm Christina Hupi, a manager of education programs and PJ's manager. Uh, it looks like PJ just sent over a merge request for me to review. I can see it here in my merge request list. And it looks like uh, he wants to resolve um, an add console log for a variable. So let's go ahead and click on that merge request. And we can review the changes. Uh, we can click on this change tab and scroll down and see what piece of code he changed. It looks like here he's got um, some a string that's pulling some random math, and then he wants to print uh, the status of which tweet he's looking at. And so he's added console.log and post status. And I can see here that he's got a small syntax error where he's missing that parentheses. Um, so that's a simple fix. So I'm just gonna go ahead and make a suggestion right here in the merge request. I can click this uh, at insert suggestion button and it actually copies the code down here. I can add that parenthesis as a suggestion and then I can type further down, added missing parenthesis and then, oops, adding missing parenthesis. We'll just type it there and send it back to PJ, back to you. And then add that comment. And then I'm going to go ahead um, and remove myself and assign it back to PJ. Hey, so I was on my GitLab and I noticed on my to-do list, I've got a little, uh, little badge there that says one. That means there's something in my to-do list. 
And it looks like I got assigned that merge request that I made to my manager back. So I'm going to go ahead and head to that merge request. And let's see. I was hoping she was just going to merge it, but um, must have been something. It uh, looks like she made a suggested change. Okay, so in line 40, I did not put an end parentheses there. And she has gone ahead and ma made a uh, change there. So it's got an end parentheses now. She gave me the ping pong back to me. I can apply this suggestion just right there because I know she's right. I'm going to apply that. Um, all the threads have been resolved. This merge request is ready. I'm going to mark it as ready, but I'm going to send it back to uh, my boss so that my boss makes the final decision to merge it or not. So I'm going to unassign myself. I'm going to assign Christina, and now she will know that it's her turn to get this thing merged. It looks like PJ has made a change to the merge request and assigned it back to me. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it. I can scroll down and see that everything in this thread has been resolved and the suggestion has been applied. So I am good to go ahead and merge this. So I'm going to go ahead and click merge. All right. I'm pretty sure my merge request has been taken care of. So I'm going to head over, head over to Divas Live and I'm going to head into my CICD and I should see it running because it got pushed to main. There it is, triggered by Christina Hoopy, so I can click into here, and I can actually take a look inside of the uh, inside of the pipeline and actually see what's going on in here and watch it get completed. So you can see it's running with a GitLab runner on a shared runner. It's using Docker with Ruby Latest. These are all instructions that I have in my CI CD. I've got build succeeded. And it's going to say it's live, job succeeded. We are good to go. My bots change is live now on the internet. And that's a quick intro on how you can use GitLab to collaborate with people. I'm going to bring Christina back in for a second. And that's the whole show. We hope you guys enjoyed seeing how we collaborated using GitLab and that quick tour of our user interface and how it can help you. Thank you. Hi, my name is PJ Met. Perfect. So yeah, that was just an example of how you would use GitLab in order to collaborate with someone else. Because like I said at the very beginning, if you're building code on your own, if you're developing it on your own and you're the only person, there's no need to really create an issue except to keep track of things. You don't have to tag other people. You just kind of do it all yourself. But when we're talking about building software, we're talking teams of... 15 and those teams are part of like 30 teams and those 30 teams are part of a company of 1700 people so the idea of collaboration and making collaboration as smooth and easy as possible is part of why you would go through something like we just did um that was obviously and i want to make sure this is very clear that was a very simple missing parentheses a lot of times it's hey this test came back with some interesting results we're wondering where the issue is and you work on what's happening. Um, so sometimes the solution is not so obvious and you end up with a lot of back and forth, but the collaboration is the aspect we were trying to show off there. So this cycle is similar to the previous cycle that we showed you for. It's all the same stages here, but now we're talking about how over here, when you're creating and verifying and packaging up your code, you can do so securely and do what's called um, shift left. Oftentimes security was left to operations and shift left is an idea of considering security earlier and especially in verify. Verify is a very important stage in a secure uh, DevOps cycle. But on this side is where you're looking at problems and you're looking at what needs to be solved and you're creating code to solve those problems. And you're verifying that your code does solve those problems. And then you're packaging it up using, using Docker or something similar. And then in the release over here, you've got the solutions to the problems that existed over here. On this side, you are defending as opposed to securing. And defend is, a, we don't call it the defend stage anymore. Uh, it's now called the, oh, I know this one. Uh, I can't remember, but we changed it from defend. Um, but what happens here is GitLab lets you manage all of this in one place. You don't have to worry about, okay, we created in this app and now we're going to take everything 
and move it to another app. And then we're going to save it in this app. And we're going to move it to another app. Or you've got your automation set up where it automatically connects from one app to another. But again, we talked about what happens when your DevOps engineer leaves and they've left you this beautifully built system that you don't quite know how to use as well as they did. So if you've got one place to do it, it leads to a nice smooth cycle where developers on this side and operations on this side can work together. And I do wanna clarify something about um, DevOps. Um, if you type what is DevOps into Google, you're gonna find 80 different people with 80 different definitions of it because it is a, it is a concept as opposed to a single um, kind of entity. First and foremost, one of the things I've learned is that DevOps is about culture is about the, uh, the people who are working on it, right? So making sure you've got the right culture that DevOps can flourish in, right? Making sure you've got the process and that the process is well-documented so people can follow the right process. And the last thing is actually tools. First and foremost, it's a culture change. Next, it's a process change. And then finally, it's about the tools you're using, right? So anything that can make the culture better is something that's better. Anything that makes the process easier is better. The actual tool you use doesn't matter except that it works for you and your team. If it doesn't work for your team, that's when you should reconsider. So when we talk about DevOps, it's protect. It's called protect, guys. When I was like, defend is something different. It's protect, I remember now, don't worry. So this is everything you need for DevOps. These are the uh, stages of DevOps here. And underneath it are the ways that GitLab has specific uh, functions inside of our uh, software as a service or inside of self-hosted that allows you to effectively operate within this. So the idea of having groups and subgroups, the idea of having DevOps reports, all of that is in manage. And manage is interesting. Manage kind of covers everything else. Manage is what allows all of this to happen. Plan is going to be making issues. Plan is going to be tracking the time spent on those issues, having boards of issues that you can easily look at and see labels on them. Planning is when you're collaborating with someone else and just talking about what it is you're going to do and how you're going to accomplish it. Create is likely the most popular stage this week at the source code management. This is where you're using Git, where you have your code reviews. You have a static site editor. This is where our web IDE lives, where you can do some development and code writing directly inside of GitLab in your browser, um, where you use your snippets and such. Verify is our CI. This is code testing and coverage. This is usability testing. Uh, this is the review apps, where you can see what the app looks like before it's actually deployed. Packaging is for containers like Docker, your package registry using the Helm chart registry. If you're doing Kubernetes, we've got Kubernetes stuff now um, that it's uh, bring your own Kubernetes to GitLab. So we're integrating with that. Secure, like we said, we talk about security and it's the earlier in the cycle that you consider security, usually the better off you are. You don't wanna, you don't wanna have this big, beautiful house you've built. And when you're ready to move in, that's when you decide what kind of lock you're gonna use. That's when you decide what kind of security system you're going to get. You need to consider that while it's being built. All right, we've got this window here, but is this too close to the ground? Should we maybe push it up a little bit? While you're designing, you should be considering security. So we've got it, you know, it's in the middle here, but like more and more, this is what we meant by shift left, shift left. Think of security earlier. Things like secret detection. Hey, did you accidentally leave? the keys to your API in the code, and now it's visible to everybody. Uh, things like code quality, is it written as efficiently as it could be? DAST, SAST, fuzz testing, all of this is securing your app. Releasing is the other part of CI, CD, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. Things like feature flags, turning on and off features to see how it works with your app. Like we said here in configure, over here is package, over here is configure. We've got uh, Kubernetes management, things like chat ops, infrastructure as code, all of these buzzwords that uh, mean a lot to a lot of people, but means a little less to me because I'm not quite there yet. But it's important for people who are really looking to efficiently make code, like make it the best that it can be, configure it so that it's, it's humming, like a beautiful machine. And then finally monitoring, what are your metrics? What is your incident management? When your app goes down, 
What do you do? That's in monitoring. On-call schedule management. Who's on call? Who's going to respond to the issue? Who's going to declare incidents when they happen? Because let's face it, your app's got a 99.8% uptime. What happens in that 0.2%? What happens when you're at Facebook and it's down for a whole day? And then finally, protect used to be defend. This is actually keeping out people that are not supposed to be in, keeping out hackers, keeping out bad actors. All of these, again, these are the stages of DevOps and all of these things down here are things that GitLab offers. We have been constantly uh, adding more and more things since we started in 2011. We just celebrated 10 years back in October of 2021. And we are constantly releasing new tools and new products that you can use inside of GitLab. So again, as a company, what are we? First commit was October, 2011. Like I said, 10 years old in October, 2021. We became incorporated in 2014. And the thing I'm most proud of for my company is our values. Uh, we don't talk about culture at GitLab, we talk about values. And those are collaboration, results, efficiency, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and transparency. These five values are the way that we drive everything we do at our company. We wanna collaborate with each other. We are results oriented and focused. We are focused on doing things efficiently and we pride ourselves on diversity, inclusion, and a feeling of belonging for our team members and for the broader community. And then finally, transparency. We try and make sure that you can know as much about it as possible. To the transparency end, we have a, a handbook that's over 2,000 web pages large where you can see literally how this company runs. We got 30 million plus registered users. We have an education program, an open source program, a startup and an enterprise program. And like I said before, we are the DevOps platform. And um, ah, no, don't scroll yet. And we are open source core. So like an open source company, you can contribute to GitLab. You can get into our code and you can help us make GitLab more efficient. And the reason we do that is because we want to know that we, we, you can see everything that the way we run things and the way we build our sites and the way we create GitLab. And we want to know from our community who uses us most, how we can be more efficient and how we can do the best that we're doing. And so being open core allows people to contribute to GitLab. And we have over 2,500 community contributors over the life of the company. And we have a hackathon every quarter where we encourage people to show up and make merge requests to GitLab the product so you can be involved with the product. To that end, our community, we have people called heroes, people who don't work for GitLab, but contribute a lot of time and effort to GitLab. And those people, when they, when they do a lot of amazing things, they end up being recognized as heroes and they get a bunch of great swag and, and we make sure we talk a lot about them and what they're doing and where they're at. It's fantastic. There are tons of organizations that are using GitLab, the DevOps platform, places like Goldman Sachs, Wish, T-Mobile, UBS, uh, where's my favorite, Ticketmaster. These major companies, Fanatics, they are building their, their apps, their web apps, their uh, phone apps, their infrastructure. They are using GitLab to build it. And we've got great relationships with these companies. And this list is always growing, of course. Like I said earlier, these values are very important to us. Um, working asynchronously, GitLab is a fully remote company, top to bottom. My manager is in one state and I am 2000 miles away. Uh, our director, our former director was in Europe. I have a couple team members in Europe as well. I have coffee chats with people who live in New Zealand where that little overlap of work time for us, we hang out and we have some coffee and we just talk about things. We collaborate asynchronously on a fully remote workforce and we use GitLab to build GitLab. We are issue first, handbook first. We are always using GitLab the way we think it should be used. Like we said, results oriented. It's about the outcomes, not how many hours you put in. Efficiency, our big thing is a boring solution wins. It's not about being fancy. It's not about being flashy. It's not about being a 10X developer. What's the boring solution that fixes it, that makes it work better immediately? That's what we focus on. Diversity, like we said, remote only. We trend towards global diversity. We have uh, uh, 
team members in countries all over the world. Like I said, uh, one of my teammates is in Germany. Um, another team of mine is in California. Another one, I hang out with people who live in Latin America, South America, the Caribbean, the Netherlands. I'm constantly talking to these people from around the world. But we hire people who add to our culture, not who fit our culture. We believe in iterations, the minimum viable change. That's the I in credit. I missed that earlier. A uh, minimum viable change. What's the smallest thing we can change that makes it better? And if you constantly make little changes that make it better, leads to a big, big, big change in the end. Rather than focusing on, I got to make this big change right now. What's the smallest change you can make that makes it better? When you focus on that, you can iterate more quickly and constantly get better and better. And then finally, like we said, transparency, public by default. We don't make it private unless we, I mean, usually it's if we're legally required to make it private. Our strategy, our roadmap, our goals, the handbook. I highly suggest looking through our handbook. It's fantastic. Like we said, that's the UI that you saw um, in the video earlier. This is in dark mode. So you've got dark mode if you want it. And then we've got a couple of things that we want that we have available um, in the slide share, the link that has been shared in the chat. You can click on all of these. You can check out our hackathon. You can contribute to GitLab, even if it's the docs. Go into the docs and you notice a spelling error, make a merge, I'm not joking, make a merge request. We want to see you join us and be a part of GitLab and be a part of this open source journey. We've got meetups from time to time. We have something called Student Spotlights. If you've built something on GitLab and you wanna show it off, apply to the student spotlights. I'll check it out. Send me a video showing me what you did. I might host you on Twitch and we can talk about what you built on GitLab. We've got a forum where you can chat with other people who are using it. A forum is a great place to get started and see what other people tend to be talking about too. And you can find interesting issues to work on in the forum as well. And just sharing your ideas, like open an issue, say a feature that you would love to see in GitLab, you know, get involved. This is us. I'm PJ Metz, Education Evangelist. That's me with the biggest smile that I inherited from my dad. That's what he does in every picture. This is Dr. Christina Huber. She's the manager of education programs. We are the education team. It's the two of us. Um, we're very, very excited that we were able to be here. Um, thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Kim, for coming through. If you're interested in being a part of the GitLab for Education program, uh, tell CityU that they can apply for the top tier. Join our education program. It already has a million plus users, a thousand plus institutions, 80 plus countries are already using GitLab for Education. It's totally free if it's used for teaching. And we want you, we want you to have it. We, we're not tricky. We're not like, you can have it, if you do this thing for us. No, just, we want you to have it. Are you using it for a classroom? Take the license, we want it for you. And finally, these are some results from our, uh, our survey response. I wanted to get to, there's another slide that I really wanted to show off. I'm gonna come back to this one. So in the survey, what we saw, we did a survey in 2020 about uh, people who were using GitLab or people who just wanted to know about DevOps in education. And what we saw was there was a multidisciplinary adoption. It's not just computer science people that are using GitLab. It is, uh, it is uh, architecture. It is, uh, I, you could use it in an English class. I absolutely can make that happen. Um, we're seeing DevOps culture come into the classroom as well. And we're seeing easier cross-campus collaboration between different schools and between different organizations on campus. And then finally, the thing the uh, of the stages, the things that tend to get used the most, and this right here, create is the biggest thing that's being used. That's where you're writing code and creating code that gets used by other people. That's the one that gets used the most. And if that's all you want to use, perfect. We're going to hope that you can learn to use these other things as well. And we want to help with that. Last thing, these are some great uh, studies that Dublin City University Harriet Watt University and University of Surrey, they've used GitLab and there's some fantastic stuff that these schools have done. Uh, Harriet Watt does not grade code anymore. They just run CI pipelines on code to make sure it works and that's how it gets graded now. So if you wanna read more about that, check out the slide share and click these links. And that's it, 54 minutes. That's the longest lecture I've given in like a year and a half. Oh, that's pretty amazing. Thank you, PJ, for sharing this like 
whole like roadmap, the history of uh, the about the DevOps like from scratch. I definitely been through all the process. So when you say like the step, like how you guys build the this kind of application, the whole platform, I was like, I keep knocking my head that oh yeah, this is exactly what we want. It's like right now it's too many things like going around. Like we don't know like how can we deal with all the complexity and then like we just the only thing that people usually do is like keep hiring the software engineer and then keep hiring a lot of people to yep. keep all the stuff together and then in the end it's just like oh wait a second just we we actually we don't need this complexity yeah we just mm -hmm. kind of like need a simplified solution for all the these questions yeah. yeah and i think also i saw during uh your presentation there's a chat from neil and he was mentioning like oh what does it feel so similar to what you are doing on GitHub, is it DevOps? And that's definitely how I first feel when I realized that I was doing DevOps stuff <laughs> yeah. all along, but you never realize that you're actually doing it. So I think that was the cool part, the aha moment. Yeah, the biggest part of DevOps is since it is a culture change, so much of it is already being done. Like Agile's not bad. It was really important. It's really useful. And it changed the way that we approach software. A lot of Agile is in DevOps. It's just taking it on that next step up. You're already doing DevOps and you don't even know it most of the time. True. Yeah, absolutely true. Yeah, thanks again for this super awesome presentation. And I know there's some questions in the chat and then I have mm -hmm. some questions myself, but before we move on to the questions, can we steal some minutes from you and then we do a raffle? Yes. Um, yeah, to see who will some cool swag, so. <laughs> I can do it. I can do a drum roll. Hold on, I can do this. <laughs> I've, literally, I've got a drum pad and sticks, so I'm ready. <laughs> Whenever you are ready, Spencer. Okay, <laughs> let me share my screen to prove that I'm not cheating. That's right. <laughs> oh, Sometimes. I can't hear it with you, Jay. I don't know why. Oh, Can you hear go. it? No. Barely, oh, barely. No. Hold on, I'll use the last side. <laughs> oh. Ooh, there, there you go. go. Now we hear it. Now we hear it. You watch that. <laughs> you probably have your noise blocking on. That's impressive that it black. it's blocking it. <laughs> yeah, there's two sides, and the soft side is what I do when I'm in a meeting and I'm like, I want to practice while I'm listening. There you go, now we go. This is so cool. Are you guys can yeah. see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Yes. Spin uh, that wheel. Okay, we have four <laughs> candidates right here. Okay, are you guys ready? Yes. Ready. Okay, let's start. Hey, Daniel. Daniel. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Okay, okay, Daniel, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna be in touch, and then uh, if you can private message me uh, your email address, please, and then I will send you a follow up email to get the confirmation. Congratulations! Thank you guys Yay, for joining. Y'all keep joining next events. There will be more swags. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. So, um, time for questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so I saw a question from Neil, and I think Christina already quickly answered that. But um, he was saying, "Oops, where is it? Let me. Where is my chat? It's gone." Oh, okay. Chat so, <laughs> so Microsoft DevOps doesn't have the built-in tools with GitLab, like GitLab does. Is that why you prefer this platform? I mean, like I prefer it because I work for them. Um, but honestly, I I like it because like it's it's one place, and that's what works best for me. I know that like for instance, um, GitHub is kind of the de facto place to go for code repositories for especially for individuals. Um, and that's like when I first learned Git. Here's here's a great story. When I first learned Git, I thought GitHub was Git. And someone was talking to me and they were like, oh, so like, do you use Git? I was like, oh yeah, I use GitHub all the time. They were like, no, no, just Git. I was like, I don't, what's the difference? And like, I didn't realize there was a difference. So it's, it's become a de facto thing. But when we're talking about DevOps, GitHub is one piece of, you know, 13 stages. It, it also has a little bit of uh, creation, a little bit of management in there where you can create issues and you can collaborate, obviously. 
But Git itself is an independent open tool that we use at GitLab. We do what GitHub does, but it's also all the other stuff. You would have to integrate GitHub with a couple of other uh, platforms, a couple of other apps in order to achieve what GitLab does on its own. Um, Azure DevOps is a Microsoft tool that has some stuff, but it's it's tied to Azure. You can't take Azure DevOps and connect it to Google Cloud or connect it to AWS. You have to use Azure. And so that's kind of limiting in, in a way. Whereas GitLab is cloud agnostic, especially. If that yeah, answers, I don't yeah, know if I just went on a tangent or not. No, like, you, had, you had a great answer, PJ. And I, I said that to, um, to Neil who asked the question. I said, well, in all truth and honesty, obviously PJ and I work for GitLab. So <laughs> we're going to have yeah, a, our own bias. Is, they gave but, it to me. Um, I do think it's a, it's a good point that PJ br brought up that it's all happening in one place. And I think that that really does remove the barrier for students who are learning, right? Because think about when you're in class and you're trying to learn something, you're, you want to focus on the outcome, not logging into different things and connecting dots and switching contacts. So we hope that it's a, it's a good learning experience, but then you have to think about an industry when you go out in the industry, what is that, what is that going to do for a company, right? It's going to have so much, you're going to get so much faster results. And so when PJ was talking about waterfall method, you would release software maybe once a year, then you move to agile, you release once a quarter. Um, with DevOps, that slide PJ showed we, with, with GitLab, we've released our own. So we do what's called dog fooding. It's kind of a weird word, but we use GitLab to, um, yeah, I, don't, we, I don't know. I, I started saying we drink our it. own champagne. Yeah, we've got, we it's, GitLab it's to build GitLab. Weird, but, it's, but it's fine. Um, I have two dogs, so I, I get it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is that we release, we release monthly for, I don't know how many, 200 months or something crazy like that. It's been five years or so of straight, a new release every month without fail. Every month. So, so you see how much faster, and that means that we don't wait till a feature is perfect to release it. We're constantly moving. Uh, and so that's really the, that's the culture, right? That's the, that's what PJ was talking about. It's a culture, it's a process, it's tools. So it's happening in this flow. And you remove, when you remove the context switching, you're removing these things hooking together, it's that much faster. And just to echo Kim's um, statement in the chat, we would love to anyone to come off mic and verbalize a question. So PJ and I were both uh, educators for a long time, so you don't have to be shy around us. We've <laughs> been in the classroom for uh, both probably a combined 30 some years. So yeah. <laughs> there's no dumb question, right? <laughs> And um, so while waiting for others, if there is nobody asking, then I have um, a very, very curious question that, so I see in a default process, there's a lot of different pits and pieces, right? And I guess that it's pretty um, easy for to have human errors amongst, you know, different pieces of the process. So is this something common? And like, what is the most common ones that you guys normally encounter? And can you share a little bit? Trying to yeah, think of like, awesome question. that's a really um, good question. Yeah, I'll start and then I'll let PJ think about it for a second. But I would say that one of the amazing things about GitLab is PJ was talking about shifting security left and shifting testing to the left. And um, so I don't know, did our demo show the pipeline running? I think I, I think it did, but it was really fast. Um, so the idea is that what, what PJ was kind of getting at there is that everything that happens after um, after you commit a code, right? Normally you would hand it to security engineers and you would hand it to compilers and then you would hand it to the bundlers, right? The packaging, and then you would deploy it. And something could go wrong at each one of those stages. And what happens with CI with, with CICD is that every time we make a commit, the pipeline is set up to run those tests automatically. So Kim, I would say if it's it's if it's configured properly you're doing that at every commit. So it's actually catching a lot more um, mis you know, mistakes and things earlier in the process, at least from the software. I'm not, I've written code, I've taught, I taught Python, but so I'm not, I'm not a full stack engineer by any way, shape or means, but um, <laughs> so, so just, but for, from my understanding and what we talk about is that, that those security tests, the, all the compiling tests, 
I'll give you an example. If we don't, if, if PJ and I make an edit to our website and we, you, we don't use a relative URL, so we go HTTP back, but it, it, the CICD pipeline fails. It says, no, you have to use a relative. And then we have certain strong language that we don't want to use um, at GitLab to make sure that we're in an inclusive environment. And if a word for some reason shows up, that you accidentally copy and paste something that you didn't mean to and you didn't notice, it will, the pipeline will fail. So that, those are just kind of examples that I have at the top of my head because that's what I do. Mm -hmm. But so I would say um, from that perspective, there's less mistakes. And I'll stop talking and say, PJ, has anything that you want to add to that? Yeah, it's, th there's always going to be some human errors. Um, the biggest one that I've encountered is working on my, my Twitter bots because that's just me. Um, I'll often in a rush commit something to main and then the pipeline will run and I'll go look at my logs on Heroku and it'll be like code one failed. And I'm like, well, and then all of, I have about seven Twitter bots. They're all down until I figure out why it failed. Now I got to go back and I'm like, why did I do this? Why did I do this? So like, that's me not following the way I should. If I'm making changes, I should be making a new branch, no matter how small the changes, make sure that that testing pipeline works. Does it work? Yes, it does. Now it's safe to merge. So a lot of the human error can come from um, not, uh, not ascribing to the DevOps culture and process as you should. Um, but I can't tell you how many times I'm in a rush and I'm like, I got to get this bot out. I got to go. And then it fails. And now, you know, my, my Shania Twain bot isn't firing and everyone's mad at me. <laughs> that makes sense. So then let's say when you, every time you publish a new feature or you make a new push and then you create a new branch. So what will you do with that branch once that feature is done? Do you delete oh, it? The branches are, uh, there's a check that you can make that it automatically deletes the branch after it's merged. Oh, I see. So okay. again, automate as much as you can. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Spencer, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Just I have a question follow up like the the Kim's question. So, so if the student they want to learn like GitLab, and then so you have like a bunch of like, different service, and which service is best service like for them to start with? Hmm. I would say uh, sign up for the free account. First off, um, go to GitLab, sign up for a free account, enter your email, and you get a free account automatically. Uh, certain things like the CI CD um, is now requiring um, uh, verification using a bank card of some kind. And what it is, it does, it does a $1 hold, and then the hold disappears in a certain amount of days. We're doing that because people were abusing our free CI CD for crypto mining, and it was overloading our servers. And it actually happened to Travis CI and JFrog, a bunch of CI people were noticing this was happening. And so we, they had to make some changes and we were included in that. Um, but once that's done, you can use uh, CI CD. You can check out all the features. There's certain things that are not included in the free tier, but you can get a taste for it for the UI and for writing your code there. So sign up for a free one. Included in your, uh, your free um, service when you sign up, is a issue, a set of issues that walk you through how to use GitLab and teach mm -hmm. you explicitly how to use it. And I made a couple of um, YouTube videos where I did it live on Twitch and then just saved the videos. And so you can watch me walk through the issues and explain why this is here, what this does, how this helps. I just have to, um, I have to find those YouTube videos and I'll put those in the chat. But going through those, uh, that project, which is like Learn GitLab, fantastic way to, to, to do it. Yeah, yeah, Steph, thank you. Thank you yeah. for like, give me the like direction that where we can go to like start with the, the GitHub. So yes. when you find those videos, um, PJ, if you can send it to me and then I'll send it to the rest of the club and then people can always rewatch it. Um, and I think uh, let's take a last question to respect everybody's time because I know we are like 15 minutes over. Um, so Neil say, I'm locked into GitLab CICD or can I bring my own? Yeah, and I just happened to find it. Uh, PJ wrote a blog post on Dev.2 uh, on how to bring your own runner and it explains everything right in there. So um, so there's a, a link to that as well. So that article is if you, if you don't, if you're unable to verify for some reason, maybe you are dangerously close to low on your bank account, maybe you're not banked, that's fine. 
those are ways to get around it. As far as Sunil's question, are you locked into GitLab CI CD or can you bring your own? I'm pretty sure that GitLab can integrate with other uh, CI CD users um, because we like to play nice and we want you to be able to use it. So if you just want to use GitLab for source control, sure, do so. And then I think there's tons of ways to integrate with other um, CI. Let me see if there's like GitLab and JFrog. I wonder if there's a way that we integrate. Uh, it's mostly like verse. Uh, let me see, GitLab and other CI CD. Yeah, I just post to the, uh, you can do Jenkins and Datadog. Definitely Jenkins, I've seen that yeah. before, but yeah. And Thanks, you can Tim. build your own runners. So PJ's blog post there covers how to build your own runners and bring them. Mm -hmm. um, but just to be, yeah, just to be clear again, what PJ said is that if you just have to enter a credit card so that we verify your identity, but you don't get charged for the runners, um, and then you get to use the free. Yeah. So definitely, thank you for answering that question. And I think today we are running a little bit late right now. So I think uh, we can stop here. And thank you everyone for joining this event. And we are really happy that you are here to share the, all the knowledge and also have the question. And we have the pretty good discussion for everything. So we will have another uh, event in the March 3rd, March 30, and we will send out the, all the uh, detail, detail about the event to your email, or if you sign out through the Bevy, which is the Google Developer Student Club, and we will also send you through the link there. So that's all for today. See you next time. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Welcome, Kim and Spencer. Thank you, Spencer. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, guys, for the Thank awesome you, time. Everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thank everyone. you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.